How's everyone doing? <laughs> Hopefully everybody's well. Uh, good evening, Scottsdale, and welcome to the primary election debate in Legislative District 23. I'm Ben Giles, a reporter for the Arizona Capital Times, and I'll be your moderator tonight. Um, a little bit about the Capital Times. We're the premier source of political news coverage in the state of Arizona. We cover everything from the governor's office to state agencies and uh, above all, the legislative process, including these elections. I've been covering the legislature for over six years now, and for our candidates tonight, if either of you are successful, you'll see a lot more of me in 2019. Before we begin, uh, I do have a couple of requests. Uh, as was previously mentioned, please silence all your cell phones and electronic devices, and please refrain from any interruption during the debate. It is being live streamed over Facebook, and is being recorded for those who'd like to watch later and for closed caption purposes. About the Citizens Clean Election Commission. The Citizens Clean Election Commission is the sponsor of this evening's debate. The Clean Elections Act is a campaign finance reform and voter education measure that was initiated by Arizona voters and passed by voters in 1998. As part of its role, Clean Elections provides clean funding for qualified participating candidates who agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and its rules. These include contribution and spending limits on their campaigns, forgoing special interest financing, and participating in debates like these. We want you, the audience, to ask the questions tonight. This debate can and should be driven by all of you. So you all got note cards on your way in the door. If you'd like, write a question on them, raise your hand, staff will come around and grab that from you and bring it to me. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you have a question for a specific candidate, just please write that candidate's name on the card, and that way I'll be able to ask them. Let's see. We scheduled 60 minutes for this debate, the first half of which I'll be asking questions of both candidates, meaning they'll both have a chance to respond. Um, we'll give you about two minutes each, and we'll swap who gets to answer first. The second half of the debate, again, I'll be asking specific questions of the candidates, I'll give you two minutes to respond again. And if, say, I ask Tim a question and Christina wants to respond as well, we'll provide you time to chip in. We'll also allow each candidate a minute for closing remarks. Um, once again, please ask questions. We do screen them for clarity and to make sure that questions aren't being asked twice. Uh, we're also looking for questions, not speeches, so we'll probably toss those if that's the case. And we do toss questions that amount to a personal attack on a candidate. We ask you to remain polite to both candidates tonight. Please give them a fair and uninterrupted debate, no matter how strongly you may agree or disagree with what they have to say. We'll start with opening statements, and we're starting alphabetically. So Tim, you have one minute. Thank you very much, Ben, and thank you very much uh, to everyone for coming. Good evening, God bless you, I'm Timothy Jeffries. I'm running for the state senate in LD23. Uh, among several things, uh, I'm tired of career-focused politicians uh, like Rep. Ugenti, who campaign one way, then vote and engage another way. I'm a conservative Republican now, and I will be and will remain if I'm elected to the Senate. I know my decades of uh, global business community service, public service, conservative engagement uh, will make a positive difference in Arizona. Uh, it is a pleasure to run, regardless of what the outcome is. This is democracy. This is America. And I sure appreciate and respect that you're all here, whether you're fixing to vote for me or not. God bless. Christina. Thank you, Ben. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Commission. Thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Christina Kelly, and I'm running for the State Senate. I'm a lifelong Republican. I was born in Washington, D.C., where my father worked for Presidents Ford and Nixon. And then I was raised in California. I went to UCLA, where I studied American politics. And I went to UC Santa Barbara, where I got a master's in education, a teaching credential. And then I went back to school. I got another master's and another credential. I started working for the Republican Governor Pete Wilson in Sacramento and his uh, Republican Secretary of State Marion Bergeson on educational policy. Once they termed out, I went to the classroom and taught for over 10 years. I love what I do. I love our community. 
and I'm here for you. I want to hear what you need and what you want. I want to be your voice and I want to work with you. I have the skill set, the education, the background, the experience to bring people together and move our state forward. Thank you. All right, first question, first couple of questions I'll warn you are gonna be about education, probably the hottest topic in Arizona at this time. Um, we'll start with Christina. Uh, many argue that public schools in Arizona are in need of more funding, even with recent gains, uh, including a budget adopted by the legislature earlier this year. Is that true? Do you think so? Do schools still need more, and if so, why? Great question. Absolutely, schools need more. We need to make sure that we are able to earmark funds to go directly into the classroom, whether we need to change legislation to do that. We need to be open to all different ideas and proposals to do that. It's extremely important. I think uh, the governor has made a great first step, as well as the legislature, and I appreciate that. But there is more we can do. We are still grossly underfunded, and we need to take care of our children because they are the future. They are the future workforce, and also good schools keep our property values up. They keep our neighborhoods safe. It's very important. And I, I don't believe in invest in ed because I believe that that only targets one group of people that needs to pay for education. But I do believe in sustainable funding. We need to be open to all proposals, all ideas. We need to come together and we need to solve this issue. As a Republican, I don't, of course, want to uh, come out of the, the gate talking about tax um, you know, rate hikes. But we do need to be open to all ideas. We need to take care of our children. Uh, and that is my stance on that. Thank you. Tim? Best I can tell, no major agency director has ever served in the House or the Senate. So if I'm honored with election, I will come to the state legislature with unique and deep insights into how much waste, abuse, and fraud there is in state government. I know for an absolute fact there are hundreds of millions of dollars that are wasted every year. I'm a no tax guy, period. But I'm even more so because I know how much money, how much of our money is wasted in government. And it's not just state government. I'd certainly take issue with municipal governments and I'd take issue with school districts. Nevada, although smaller, has 18 school districts. Arizona has 272 public school districts. If you add in charters, other private initiatives, we have 666 school districts. It's an interesting number. <laughs> There's plenty of money in education. We need a massive consolidation, dare I say eradication, of the education bureaucracy. We need to significantly restructure and reform public schools to get the money where Ms. Kelly rightfully said it should be, in our classrooms, for our teachers, for valued staff, ultimately for the benefit of our kids and the benefit of our future for Arizona. Anything to add, Christina? Yes, I agree with Tim. We definitely need to make sure we take a look at waste. We need to be mindful of waste and spending, and we need to redirect those dollars to the appropriate locations. Something else that we need to make sure we um, fund are counselors. There are roughly 900 students to each counselor, and mental health is a big issue in our state and in our schools. We also need to support uh, school resource officers, which are armed officers, which also protect educate and counsel our schools. That would further protect us and we currently don't have funding for that, so we need to find funding. Thank you. And we'll talk a little bit more about school safety later, but uh, continue on the topic of school funding. Um, our next question, we'll start with you, Christina. Uh, the Republican-controlled legislature have no doubt routinely lowered taxes in Arizona. Um, do you think that that has accomplished the uh, stated goal of attracting business and thereby actually raising revenues? Do you think that the uh, lower tax structure that Arizona has has developed that environment where there's enough new revenue to go around to help fund things like education? That's a great question. I 
was in California for most of my life. My husband and I and our four children have been here for the last 14 years. And I can tell you that California has a lot more regulations, a lot more taxes, and it's very difficult to start a small business there. I was a small business owner with my sister. We uh, put together educational DVDs that taught children Spanish. My sister and I are both fluent in Spanish. And we were very, very fortunate that we were able to do that here in Arizona. There are not as many regulations here. The tax code is simpler, but there is definitely more we can do. And as legislators, we need to constantly review the tax code, make sure that we are attracting new business. But part of attracting new business is having a strong educational system. Companies are, want, are going to want to come to our state if they know their children are going to be in a strong educational system, if they know that they're going to be in a workforce uh, that is going to be utilized. So we definitely need to support education for that reason alone, and we need to make sure that we have fewer regulations to continue to attract business here in Arizona. Tim? Bigger the government, the smaller the citizen smaller the government, the bigger the citizen. Arizona government, although smaller than most states, is, is still too big. As underscored by my previous comments, as punctuated by the fact that we have districts run amok. Sure, they want money. More the better. But where is the reform? Where is the restructuring? Where is the treatment of our hard-earned tax dollars in a way that they understand how sacred it is to ensure those dollars are going to our kids and their trusted teachers, their counselors, and the like? Arizona's economy, just like our country, is on fire in a good way. We need to continue to stoke that fire because that fire benefits all. Work is good. Unemployment's as low as it's been this century. The worker participation rate is as high as it's been for some time. Our brother and sisters in the minority community have more jobs than ever. We need to continue to endeavor, if need be dramatically, to ensure Arizona is the mecca that is, is becoming. We've had 300,000 people move here since Governor Ducey was our governor. We need to keep that going. People are moving from California here for a reason. Low taxes, less regulation, less government, less corruption, less bureaucratic political nonsense. So do I think our tax decreases have attracted business? Absolutely. And just a follow-up to that last question, do you think that it's necessary to raise taxes to get more funding into Arizona public schools? Tim? Absolutely not. Christina? I would like to review uh, funding, and hopefully we can find funding by cutting waste and not having to raise taxes. No one wants to raise taxes, but we do need to be creative and we need to be open to all proposals and we need to come to the table with an open mind. I think we found that there's a lot of frustration in our community about how we currently fund or underfund education. We saw that with Red for Ed, people are frustrated and we need to be open as legislators and our door needs to be open and we need to be willing to work with all different types of points of views to move our state forward. And speaking of that Red for Ed movement, you know, there were tens of thousands of teachers at the Capitol this spring who really moved that conversation about education funding to the forefront. Um, do you think teachers made the right decision in holding a strike, Christina? That's a, a tricky question. I am a proud second grade teacher at Laguna Elementary School. I love my students, and I can tell you honestly, um, eyeball to eyeball, all of my coworkers love their students too. They love their job. I was a parent there, PTO president first, and then I became a teacher there. And I was so impressed with their dedication. No one wanted to walk out on their students. I think that their level of frustration um, was unbelievable. They did not feel that they had any other option. And as a legislator, we need to make sure that we give 
our citizens, our voters, our community options. We don't want it ever to happen again that people feel that they have no other option, that they have to walk out. But teachers were walking out not because they didn't love their students, not because they didn't love their job, but because they wanted to pay their bills, they wanted to afford insurance, they wanted to get back in the classroom, but they needed the respect and they needed the ear of the legislature and Governor Ducey. And I, I, I wish it hadn't gone as long as it had because I think there are a lot of families that were hurt, but I understand what happened and I think that we can look at that from a learning perspective and make sure that we learn from it so that it never happens again. Tim? Uh, my wife, uh, Mary Frances, is a headmaster at a K-5 through charter school, part of the Great Hearts Network. So if you want to talk about low teacher pay, let's start talking about charter schools. Because on average, they make 70% less than public school teachers. Mary France School, as well as all the Great Heart schools, stayed open. One of the reasons they stayed open is because a strike for public employees is illegal. Another reason they stayed open is as much as we should support teachers, schools are about our kids. And if you go to some of the poorest of poor places in Arizona, the kids who did not go to school not only were unattended to in many situations, but they had parents who desperately need their jobs, who couldn't work those days. Throw in the mix, I think the I think it's about 60 plus percent of Arizona kids need free and reduced lunch. So all those schools that closed, kids didn't get to eat. Now, I'm sure there were some food somewhere. The strike should not have happened. It was illegal. Now, kudos to the Red for Red movement. They sure got people's attention and that is democracy. As a result of it, uh, the governor committed to a 20% increase by year 2020, and I wish, uh, I wish that commitment would have been there in the state of the state address, because then we wouldn't have had any of this. Well, maybe some, but not 50,000 people marching on the Capitol, which was a beautiful visual for the rest of the world to see because only in America. Christina, do you have anything to add? I just want to uh, reiterate that I, I agree it's unfortunate that it happened and it happened for as long as it did, but I'm really proud of my school community, especially in Scottsdale, Fountain Hills, and Rio Verde. They actually came together, the PTO, and the teachers, everyone came together and collected food to pass out to students. We worked with the Boys and Girls Club so that they would have free services for children who could not afford to go there so the parents could still go to their jobs. So I'm really proud of our parent community, our teacher community for coming together and taking care of those kids because I know that was a difficult time for families. And uh, I just want to say that I was really proud of our community. So the next step for the Red for Red movement was to collect signatures to refer a law to the ballot that would raise taxes on some of the Arizonans in the wealthiest two income brackets. Um, what do you see, uh, what do you think about that approach? Do you support the initiative Invest for Ed, Tim? Uh, I absolutely do not support the class warfare of a tax the rich schema, particularly since seven out of 10 small businesses file under a personal income tax regimen. So this well-intended invest for ed initiative will crush small businesses in Arizona. And by the way, seven out of 10 new jobs are created by small businesses. Jobs aren't typically created hundreds and thousands at a time. They're created one at a time. Men and women who put everything on the line to create work, to be awesome, to seize the American dream. I don't support the invest for ed tax increase. I don't support any tax increases. We need to reduce the state workforce by 10% excluding corrections, 
public safety and homeland security. We need to retire all IT systems from last century. And as I stated already, we need to slash the number of school districts throughout our state. I'm telling you, there's probably a billion plus a year of waste in our state government of our hard-earned tax dollars. It's not just, it's not about raising revenue, it's about treasuring the revenue we have right now and optimizing it. Christina? I also do not support the Invest in Ed um, movement. And I'd like to be very clear though, I do support finding sustainable funding for education. We just have to be very careful that we do not hurt small businesses because we want to encourage job growth, business growth. We want to encourage businesses from California, from other states to come here. And if they are going to be crippled by new and increased taxes, they're not going to want to come to Arizona. So we do need to work together. We need to be creative, whether it's finding waste, cutting waste, consolidating school districts. We need to be creative. We need to be open. But I believe that is the wrong uh, tax to pass at this point. I think that's going to be hurting a certain group only. And we all need to take responsibility. We all need to support and fund public education. Tim, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll just add, Rob Rob, a highly respected columnist with the Arizona Republic, and of course for me it's tough to put respected and Arizona Republic in the same statement. Um, he wrote, I thought, a brilliant and insightful article in follow-up to our state legislature and our governor's commitment to give teachers a raise they deserved. And he talked about state finances. State economy's booming. And that's uh, why uh, our state government went from there's no money to, oh, there's plenty of money. Economy's booming. But the truth of the business cycle is coming. There will be a recession, hopefully no sooner than 2021. Hopefully when it comes, not if it comes, when it comes, it will be shallow, not deep. But there will be pressure and compression on state finances. And the time for us to engage in dramatic action is now. Christina, we've talked a lot about uh, competing ideas for how to increase funding for education. And, and you did say that uh, you want to be open to ideas and that there is a need, I, I think you said, for a new dedicated funding source, um, what is your best idea now for what that dedicated source could be? Well, we definitely need to cut waste where we can. First and foremost, we need to have uh, a, perhaps an oversight committee of some sort to take a peek at where we can immediately cut waste, whether it's consolidating districts, because as Tim said, we have over 600 districts here. Nevada, of course, is quite a bit smaller, but they only have just over 40 school districts. So we do need to be open to that idea. We need to be open to cutting uh, programs that are uh, not efficient at this point, but we also need to be open to um, other ideas. And lots of legislators had ideas, uh, and we need to make sure that we're open and listening to all different ideas. And Tim, is, is fraud and waste, is eliminating that, do, does that qualify as a, a new dedicated funding source? Is that enough? I think our dedicated funding source is uh, the $10 billion a year that our state government receives. It's not an issue of this stream or that stream. We have $10 billion flowing in the state government, and on top of that, upwards to $20 billion in federal dollars, which, by the way, are our dollars. That, unfortunately, we have to ship across the Mississippi River in hopes that we get some of it back and we never get as much as we send there, right? So we have a $10 billion funding stream, and we need to do a better job, a more transparent job, at prioritizing that massive funding stream. There's a lot of money wasted on this, that, and the other thing, and it needs to end. Anything to add, Christina? No, not at this time. So I'd want to talk a little bit about uh, another area of public education, higher education. Uh, one of the questions was that uh, the Arizona Constitution has a provision that states that 
the public universities and other educational institutions in Arizona shall be as nearly free as possible. Uh, Tim, has the state delivered on that? Studies clearly show that the more federal loan dollars that flow into universities across the spectrum, the more expensive universities become. There is a positive correlation between federal aid money flowing into universities and tuition going up. It is a farce. It's an absolute farce. Do I believe our great Arizona universities are providing as free as possible of education? Well, not based on the sticker price, but based on all this money that inefficiently flows into universities. For the people in need, it's pretty darn good. Christina? I think we're doing a pretty decent job. Of course, we can look at ways to see if we can make it um, even lower cost for students in need, absolutely. Something that I would recommend we do, though, is support and fund more vocational training and also uh, on-the-job training in high school that would lead into um, the universities. Not everyone is going to want to go to university. Not everyone is um, made to go to university, and there's nothing wrong with going to a trade school or going through vocational training, on-the-job training. So I, I believe we need to be creative again, and we need to revamp that aspect of education to make sure that we're meeting all the needs of all different students. Anything to add, Tim? Yes. Well, Ms. Kelly raises a beautiful point, and, and that is uh, not everyone is meant to go to college, and that's A-OK. -okay. Uh, I was the first in my family's entire existence in America to go to university. My family is blue-collar to the core. The company my wife and I own, uh, 80 folks, only four college degrees, and it is beautiful, honorable work. Work is good. Uh, when we were going to school, there was vocational training. But in the 90s, uh, people started to call that tracking. And it was bad. No, it's not. What's bad is our schools not arming all our kids, not just the smart kids, but all our kids, to be successful so they can pursue their humble American dream. And we're just getting questions in, so thank you everyone for that. I'm gonna backtrack just to the Red for Ed movement at least one more time. Um, this should be a pretty quick question to answer. Did either of you participate in the Red for Ed walkout? Tim? I did not. Christina? Excellent question. Our schools were already closed. I did take my four kids on the very first day down to Red for Ed. I wanted them to see democracy in action. Their teachers were down there. They were curious. They wanted to know what was going on. I thought it was an excellent learning opportunity, and I wasn't allowed to be in my classroom anyway, so I thought it was a great opportunity to see what was going on. And uh, I was um, inspired by how many uh, teachers came together towards the cause. I think that's great. I just wish that we could have um, solved the issue without having teachers felt the need to walk out um, ahead of time. And as legislators, that is our duty to always keep our door open, keep the conversation going, and make sure that we are taking care of everyone, including teachers, parents, community members. Yeah. Anything to add, Tim? As I stated earlier, the visual of 50,000 folks uh, walking in red in the heat, 50,000 simple, hardworking, kid-loving folks, it's, it's impressive. As an American, it gives me chills. But the, the strike was illegal. Now, was that Christina's fault? No. Was it any number of other teachers' faults? No. The school districts shut down. School districts have failed our teachers, our kids, and I could go on. Because they took the easy way out by shutting down, much to the disservice of the poorest of the poor kids in our state. 
All right, back to higher education. Um, this is also uh, an immigration-related question. The Supreme Court denied in-state tuition for DACA students, those who qualified for deferred action for childhood arrivals. That means those DACA students in Arizona must pay more than Arizona residents to attend schools like Arizona State University and the University of Arizona. Uh, Christina, do you agree with the court's decision? We need to come together as a state, as a legislature, once and for all, and we need to stop politicizing the issue. We need to come together with an answer, and um, that is a very emotional, very difficult question because I understand both sides of it. These are students who have been here and have participated um, in our community, and of course they would like to go to school and they need help financially going to school. I understand the other side of it as well. People are going to argue they didn't come legally. Uh, immigration is a very emotional issue, and I understand everyone's desire to want to come here. It's a wonderful country, but we need to make sure that people are coming here legally, and are, are, we just need to make sure we're doing it in the correct way. Um, just quick follow-up, though. So for those students, was the was the decision the right one? Should they have to pay a different rate and not in state tuition rate? Well, technically, um, I think it was correct, yes. Okay. And Tim? Uh, the Supreme Court ruling was absolutely correct. The Supreme Court is tasked to rule on law, not to make law. Um, I mean, God bless these kids. But in-state tuition is for in-state citizens. And to obfuscate that point uh, serves no one well. Our country is here for many reasons, by way of divine providence. But if we can't take care of our own, how can we take care of everyone else? These 2,000 kids separated from their families because their families endangered them by coming here illegally, I'm praying for them, big time. But where are all the broken hearts for the uh, 600,000 kids in foster care in our country? Where are all the broken hearts for all the kids being murdered in Chicago? Darn near every day. Ms. Kelly's right. The politicization needs to stop. And I think focusing on the rule of law is a great way to start. Anything to add, Christina? No. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna agree on a lot of things tonight, so it's okay. Sure. Um, so I've only got a few questions so far that are for specific uh, candidates. So at least for the, a while longer, I'm just going to continue asking you both questions. Are you, are you sure you don't want to talk about education any longer? <laughs> <laughs> well, we could if you want. Uh, but we do have some other questions. For example, um, uh, Tim, you mentioned the, the separation of uh, children and families who are coming over the border seeking asylum. Um, Christina, you get first crack at this question. Um, do you think that state officials uh, have done enough to express outrage over that separation, or, or, or should they even be doing that? Well, it's really a, a federal issue. However, I know uh, that state officials have a, a say, and it's part of their concern. I, I know, again, it's a political issue. It's an emotional issue. It's a tough issue. The news is doing an excellent job of showing us these very, very um, sad graphic um, pictures of these children being separated. I commend President Trump and his administration for trying to get them back as quickly as possible. Um, that's a tough situation. I'm a mother of, of four kids, and I, I understand the desire to want to come to the United States, but it needs to be done in a legal way. And unfortunately, um, it was not, and those individuals knew the, the repercussions, and uh, we now need to move forward. They're breaking the law, and it, it's tough. It's very, very tough. But I am happy that they're going to be reunited soon. And Tim? As Ms. Kelly stated, the politicization of this uh, human crisis needs to stop. So have Arizona elected officials expressed enough outrage at some level, who cares? Can we just have some freaking action? Can we have some action? 
there's outrage all over the place, both sides of the aisle, all across the sp spectrum. But where is the action? OK, a court decided to make policy and say kids need to be together, although we've been separating kids to keep them safe. Fine. 50 or so have been reunited. I hope they'll be safe. But how much longer is it going to take to reunite the rest of them? I don't know. But I know if I turn on the news tonight, I'll hear a bunch of outrage. Enough words, more action, less political, more public service. All right. Anything to add, Christina? I'd like to add that I, I do believe we need to take care of Arizonans first and foremost. It's a shame what's happened down there, but we do need to take care of our own children. We need to take care of our own state. And this has been an issue that has been very important to our voters. They're concerned about the safety of our borders. We need to secure our borders, but most importantly, we need to have a safe community, whether that's at school, in your neighborhood, on the borders. We need to have a safe community for our children and for our families to grow up in. And let's go to a little bit more of a local topic here. Um, Tim, you'll get first crack at this question. Sure. Uh, as, a, as a senator, what changes would you try and make to make this district, to make Scottsdale, a better place? Well, first I'll state that District 23 uh, is blessed to uh, encompass most of Scottsdale, but it also encompasses all of Fountain Hills, all of Rio Verde, and the uh, wonderful McDowell Yavapai. Yavapai Tribal Nation. So it's not just me looking to take care of my uh, Scottsdale peeps. Uh, it's me looking to engage uh, very transparently, very actively uh, with folks throughout the district. Uh, a model for me in engaging the district would be Representative Jay Lawrence, a beautiful, proud veteran serving with distinction in the legislature. He is ubiquitous in the district. I think one of the ways we make our district better is to ensure um, both members of the House and in the Senate engage the district like Rep. Lawrence so we can hear directly from the people. And I have, uh, I have that verb. I have that ethic. When I was DES director, I didn't visit 10 to 20 sites like my predecessors. I visited all 164 sites. I held over 500 town meetings. I never left until every question was answered. I responded personally to 14,000 emails. You want to make things better? Be with the people. Listen to them. Let them be the smartest people in the room, because they'll tell you everything you need to do. And Christina, what changes would you make as a senator to try and improve Legislative District 23? First and foremost, my door would be open. I would want to hear from you, and I would want to know what you want. I've heard time and time again that certain legislators have not returned emails or phone calls or have not been receptive to other people's input. They've only been receptive to their own predetermined agendas, and that is not who I am. I have been a teacher, PTO president, small business owner, parent, wife. And first and foremost, I listen. You have to listen to what everyone needs and what they want. I have heard from our community, from parents, from community leaders, they want safe schools, they want funded schools. And again, another way to do that is through supporting mental health in the schools. We need counselors to help our children because every time you turn on the TV, there's another school shooting every month. We need to have counselors in there helping to take care of the kids who have mental health issues, to secure our schools, and school resource officers who are also going to educate, who are going to protect, and who are going to counsel the students. They're an armed officer. They're at the school all the time to help protect the school. We need to protect our children because they are the future of our district. And most importantly, you need to be a senator that's willing to work with other senators, with the governor, and with the legislator. You need to be willing to work with everyone, not just your own district. Thank you. Tim, any response? Yes. Unlike uh, the third candidate in this race who is uh, MIA tonight, uh, Ms. Kelly and I have been walking the district. And I suspect uh, she has heard the same types of things I've heard. And that is border security is important. Public safety is paramount. 
life and family issues aren't just religious issues, they're cultural issues. They're issues of sustainability. Uh, education is on everyone's mind, whether they want it on their mind or not. It's tougher not to be on your mind. I mean, we spent a half hour on it tonight. This, and job creation is important too. And I have a huge love for small business people. And that's gonna be a major area of focus because when the economy's great, they succeed. When the economy's tough, they have challenge. The less government we have, the less challenge they'll have. All right. And speaking of education, we've got more. Really quickly about that? Really quickly, 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds, great. Um, along the, uh, the lines of um, public safety, I would have supported Blue Lives Matter, which was an important, um, Luckily, it was signed into law by Governor Ducey, but it was um, a, a law that was, would have actually prevented people from targeting off-duty officers and make it a stricter penalty for targeting them as a hate crime. Uh, I would have signed that, I would have, or not signed, I would have supported that. I think it's very important that we protect our law officers, uh, DPS. I think we need to support those who protect us. So again, um, more questions about education. Sorry about the, uh, um, That's good. the governor had a, had a push uh, mid-session this spring to change laws about school safety. Uh, that included an effort to allow people through the courts to petition the courts to remove firearms from dangerous individuals, determined dangerous by the court uh, for a, a temporary period of time. Um, that did not happen, that, that fell short. Um, Tim, what did you think of that proposal? And do you think it, it's the governor, if reelected, has vowed to bring it back next year? I think the governor's school safety program would have been a big step. And I think we can agree there's urgency to that step. Israel has not had a school shooting since the early 70s. And that's because they have an armed resource officer at every school. Now, should it take that? No. But evil exists. And we see it front and center in our country, even more so. But what I know for a fact, guns in the hands of good people don't hurt anyone unless it's bad people. So it's not issue of guns. It's an issue of having them in the right hands. We need more school resource officers. I view the governor's plan as, as purely as a down payment, a first step. And I think it's ridiculous that it wasn't passed. And I think it's ridiculous that the uh, member of the House, who uh, has other things to do tonight, wasn't lead the charge to fight for it. We need to protect our kids. And we're in a dangerous world, and it's okay to arm people to protect them. Lord knows I got plenty of guns to protect my family. And I wouldn't hesitate to use them if evil struck. Christina. I had the pleasure of speaking with a women's group about a month ago, and I had a young lady who went to the women's group with her mom. She's going to be a freshman at Desert Mountain High School. Her name is Elizabeth. I won't say her last name, but she was lovely. And she was a little bit nervous because it's the first time that she'd ever gone to this club with her mom. And she was excited to hear that I was another female running, and um, she looked me right in the eye and said, I'm, I'm worried. What are you going to do? What is the governor going to do to keep us safe in school? And I looked at her and I said, you know, that's a great question. If I'm elected, I'm gonna do everything in my power to keep you safe. I agree with Tim, guns in the right hands are, 
are safe. We don't want to penalize law-abiding citizens and take their guns away. However, we do need to have a, a safety program in place. We need to have SROs fully funded at every school. We used to have one at my school. He was there 100% of the time. He was lovely. He knew the students. He kept us safe. We never had to use him, which is great but we knew he was there. He gave us peace of mind. The kids knew him by, on a first uh, name basis, and they were not afraid of the police because he was there. He knew about them. They knew him. He knew their families, but that was cut, and we need to make sure that we reinstate that fully. We need to support that, um, and again, we need to, I'm sorry to say it again, but we need to also reinstate counselors. We have counselors in middle school, we have counselors in high school, we don't have counselors in elementary school at the rate that we need them. Again, we have them 900 to one. That's 900 students to one counselor. There's no way that counselor is going to know your name, your needs, your priorities, your fears. So as I looked at Elizabeth, I said I'm gonna do everything I can, and I really will. I wanna make sure that our schools are safe not only for Elizabeth, but for my own students. As a teacher, we've had to go through lockdowns and they're scary. I've had my kids look at me and they're fearful and you try to alleviate that fear as best you can, but it's real fear. And students should go to school joyfully, happily, and knowing they're gonna learn, and most importantly, they're going to be safe. So um, clearly you both support more SROs, more resources for those officers to be in schools. Um, but the part of the governor's proposal that arguably sunk it, uh, that didn't draw enough support, particularly from Republicans in the legislature, was what I mentioned before, the, the method by which an individual can petition the court um, to have someone else's firearms uh, temporarily taken from them, taken from the home they live in even. Um, the governor is going to make that push again uh, in, in 2019. Christina, what do you think of that process? Do you think that should be a part of the governor's plan going forward? I do. It is a slippery slope, though. You need to have evidence. You need to go to court. You can't just accuse someone because you're mad at them that their guns should be taken away. You need to be really careful, and that's why there needs to be due process before you take someone's guns away. Of course, we want our children to be safe, but with due process, I believe that we can do that in the right way, but we need to keep our children safe, so I think that he should pursue that in the next session. Yes. And Tim? Due process is enshrined in our U.S. Constitution. We're a great nation because we're a nation of laws. Due process is increasingly optional for any number of initiatives, movements in this country. Um, I support the governor's plan. Could it be tweaked? Perhaps, I know for a fact, it should include even more money for school resource officers. Because I agree with Ms. Kelly. It's reflective of my comments. We should have a school resource officer at every school to protect the most precious of our society, our kids, our future. Uh, another education-related question. <laughs> Go figure. Um, we live in a, a pretty technical world now. Um, how do you think schools can and should be on the cutting edge of some of the technology that is out there today? Tim. Our 20th century education model is not satisfactory for our 21st century needs. We need to be open to taxpayer freedom, parental choice, and education reform and innovation. We need to be disruptive in our initiatives. We cannot incrementalize. Think of it, 666 school districts. How many IT systems is that? Well, at least 666. But then again, at DES, your Department of Economic Security, we looked after 40 uh, 40 plus programs, and we had over 100 IT systems. What? Think what it is in our school districts. People tell me district consolidation has been tried and it's not possible. That's ridiculous. What are we gonna, wave the white flag on our kids? Sorry dudes, tried, not possible. Parents love their turf. 
Superintendents love their turf. School boards like to be elected. We need massive consolidation in our school districts, which will lead to a massive consolidation of IT systems. And as I stated for state government, the same should apply in school districts. We need to retire every IT system that dates back to last century. We need to move to the cloud. And we'll save a ton of money. Christina. I uh, have the pleasure of working in a school that has an A++ rating, which is very, very difficult to do. And we really have focused on technology because it is the wave of the future. We have an iPad cart, we have a couple iPad carts, we have a computer lab, we have two computer labs. And I think this is important uh, because it is the wave of the future, but it's also important because they were done with partnerships with private companies. We need to be open to partnerships with private companies. We need to uh, we've already partnered with Intel at our school, which is wonderful, but we also need to go back to the basics. We need vocational training. I know I've said it already, but we need to bring back the trades. We need to bring back shop class in high school, cooking classes. We need to make sure that we are reaching the needs of all of our students, all of our future producers, and all of our learners, because not everyone is going to be in IT, not everyone is going to go to college, but as a teacher, that was my job, that is my job. As a parent, I need to make sure that I'm reaching the needs of my own students and my own children, and uh, that's what the schools need to do as well. Any follow-up, Tim? Yes, I focused, I focused on the bigger picture because uh, in government, in business, in life, it's the tone at the top. And if we have rampant waste at the top, we're not setting the right tone for the classrooms. There are all sorts of beautiful tech initiatives in different districts, different schools, and a lot of them are funded by parents, even though parents are already paying tax dollars. We need to free up more money in districts so we can move rapidly and vigorously to technology in a way that positions our kids, whether they go to college or not, to be technologically conversant. Because even our plumbers and our electricians and our HVAC people are going to need to be technologically conversant. Heck, Stanley Steamer was over the other day, and these two beautiful dudes, these two beautiful immigrants, they had their, their iPads, and they're doing everything on the iPads. All right, so we have a little bit more time. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for specific candidates. Um, I know it's getting hot in here, so hopefully we'll be wrapping up soon. Um, Kelly, we're going to start with you. This is a question about the Arizona Lottery, which its mission is to responsibly generate net revenues for the benefit of Arizona programs. Um, there was even a, a proposal uh, in the legislature this year uh, for a new uh, I think it was like a $30 scratcher lottery game. Um, do you think the lottery is, uh, is fulfilling its mission and do you think those sorts, of, uh, those sorts of games, those sorts of scratchers are appropriate? I, I don't think that they are fulfilling their, their uh, promise to education. I think that we need to re-examine them. We need to make sure that they are fulfilling their promise. Um, I'm not personally a huge gambler, but if it's going to support education, great. But it's not currently doing that, so we definitely need to re-examine it and move forward in that regard. Anything to add on that, Tim? Well, I was blessed to know the former director of the Arizona Lottery, and he was uh, driving transformative change to ensure the lottery was run better than it ever was, up to including jettisoning special interest deals. Uh, unfortunately, his tenure uh, came to an early close because of the attacks he suffered. Lottery does generate a lot of money. Uh, there's laws around where it goes. Uh, could it be better? Could it be bigger? Well, I'll say it could be better because I've never won a scratcher. Uh, and if it's going to be bigger, I hope I finally win a big scratcher. Uh, so how big it should be, I don't know. but. Uh, in the lottery, like any number of other agencies, there's, there's a need for reform. 
Uh, Tim, a question for you, uh, another education question. Of course, um, thank you. As you mentioned, uh, your wife works in a charter school. Um, certainly there are plenty of charter schools in LD23. Um, what do you think the, uh, the type of impact those charter schools have had in the district is, and, and what is the future of charters existing with public schools in LD23? When Mary Frances and I moved to Arizona, we had no idea it was ground zero for education innovation as, as highlighted by the uh, growth of charter schools. Uh, Arizona is blessed with some great charter schools. Uh, the Great Hearts Network is one of the top in the nation, and we read about BASIS all the time. BASIS is, uh, is headquartered in Scottsdale, and five, I'm sorry, six of the top 10 performing high schools in America are BASIS schools here in Arizona. It's pretty amazing. I will be a uh, fearless protector of ongoing innovation by way of charter schools and other education options that may be embryonic or yet to be visualized. Um, our district is, is one of the wealthiest in the state. Uh, we have nice problems in our district. But you know, I've been to every tough district in the state when I was DES director. Most of those districts aren't blessed with the wealth, resources, parents, community that we have. And so where we really need to bring charter innovation, education innovation to bear, is, is where our poor brothers and sisters live. And we can't incrementalize it. We have to be audacious. Christina, uh, any quick response? Charters have made our public schools even better. I think that they've made them more competitive, which has been great. And I have lots of uh, friends who go to charters and they've been very, very happy with them. We are very fortunate that we live in a state of choice, which is wonderful. I personally don't support Prop 305 because I believe that it makes uh, ESAs too broad and takes away from our public schools. I think there needs to be a balance I, I do believe that uh, we have amazing public schools and we need to continue to support them and also support the charters. I believe we can do both at the same time. And Tim is absolutely correct. We live in a, an amazing LD. We're very fortunate. Scottsdale is wonderful, but there are other schools that need our help as well. Uh, Christina, uh, a question about small business, I suppose. Um, this January was the, the first year of what will be several consecutive increases in the state's minimum wage. Um, now $10 an hour. Do you think that the higher minimum wage um, had uh, uh, maybe put small businesses at a disadvantage? Uh, will, would it continue to do so as it increases to $12 an hour? Well, good news, bad news. Um, it's going to be more difficult for small businesses, but we are doing well as a district, so that's excellent news. I understand both sides of that. I have nephews who are entering the workforce, and of course they would like to have as much pay as possible, but it will uh, be more of a challenge for small businesses. We need to make sure that we find regulations to help our small businesses grow and continue to find ways that we can grow business in our state so that a simple hike in uh, a minimum wage will not hurt them. Tim, quick response if you have one. Uh, studies clearly show that the increase of the minimum wage actually uh, does not result in rising wages. It does not result in higher employment. It actually results in compression on wages and uh, lower employment. Um, I get it. Raising the minimum wage makes people feel good. Uh, it's well intended. But even though the minimum wage is around 10 bucks, I drove by a Taco Bell the other day, not that I'm bragging, um, and they are advertising jobs at 11 bucks an hour. No one told them to do that. Oh, I'm sorry, the marketplace told them to do that. We should let the marketplace work because it works. And when people are desperate for people, they increase wages and businesses are desperate for people. And as a result, wages are up. All right, 
Question for you, Tim. Um, you have a kind of unique distinction, as you said earlier, of being a, a former agency director who could now potentially represent uh, the state in the legislature. I don't know uh, in my research that I could find anyone in that situation either. Um, and there's also the distinction of uh, you are currently involved in a lawsuit, a defamation case against the state of Arizona stemming from uh, leaving DES. I just want to give you an opportunity to explain the nature of that case and, and kind of what it means going forward during the campaign. Yeah, well, much to my mother's uh, joy and sometimes consternation, I am an easy Google. But with me, what you see is what you get. I stand proudly on my record at DES. I was blessed to lead 8,000 employees and contractors and darn near met every single one of them. Since I departed, I've heard directly from over 2,000 of them. Many of them are here. I was compelled to resign the day before Thanksgiving. I was out. I was done. One week later, governor's office leaked this, uh, this, this malicious, libelous nonsense about guns and ammo, which, by the way, I do not regret one bit having the spine to protect my people and protect my clients. There were 30 offices that already had armed protection. Most of the offices are staffed primarily by women. I increased the number of armed offices by 10. And then San Bernardino happened. And I said, I'm going to protect every office, all 77. I don't regret it. What I regret and what will vex me for some time to come is the malicious and libelous attack launched post my departure in an effort to make me radioactive because the governor's office was deluge with support for me during my epic public bleed and after me and my ouster. Government power should never be used to destroy a good person, their good name, and their ability to make money. Christina, any comment? Uh, no, I, um, it has been lovely to be up here with, with Tim, and we've uh, worked very well together, and this has been great. And he and his wife have been very kind to me, and I appreciate their, their support and their warmth. All right, we've got time for one more question. I know I'm going a little bit over the 60 minutes, but uh, this question for Christina. Um, you've mentioned uh, a couple different times tonight that you have, uh, you take issue with uh, the capacity for uh, mental health services in our schools. Um, what is the resolution uh, for solving that? And, and if it's more school counselors, a part of the debate at the legislature was how to, how to afford that. There, there are hundreds of schools that don't have that resource. How do we afford that? We need to cut waste. We need to find the money. We have the money. We need to redirect the money. We need counselors. I had a student this last year that would have really benefited from a counselor and there were no resources for this student and that is unfortunate. We used to have uh, a relationship with a business in town that offered free services that was cut. So this poor child was left with no services and as a teacher you are already working your tail off to teach, take care of these students, make sure they get where they need to go, you're communicating with their parents, you're making sure that they're fed before school, during school, sometimes after school, um, and also teaching to the standards on top of all that, and you're making sure that they are becoming productive citizens. If this individual had a counselor or someone to help him, I think um, his path would have been a little bit different, and he's no longer in our school, and that is unfortunate. Um, I believe that counselors can help screen children, help children, counsel children, and we, we need that. I think you all can 
agree with me that it's it's very scary, it's very depressing when you turn on the news and you see another school shooting and everyone says, oh, I, I saw that coming, I knew that was gonna happen. Well, if that child had had some counseling or if we could have helped his family, given them some tools, I'm sure that a lot of that could have been avoided. So we definitely need to find counselors. We need to uh, find them at every level of school. Again, 900 to one is not okay. We can do better. And I hope that you all would support that as well. Tim, time for a quick response. I'm always gonna be a poor kid from a shattered family of East Sacramento, California. I grew up on the wrong side of the river. And truth be told, given the chaos and the violence I came from, there are great teachers and coaches and counselors that not just changed the trajectory of my life, they ultimately saved my life. And that was in full focus, particularly in middle school and high school, when it was very difficult to escape all the hell surrounding a place I wouldn't trade because it makes me who I am. It's not just about taking care of our teachers. It is teacher aides, coaches, and the like. All right, uh, it's time for closing remarks. You'll each have a minute for this. Um, I believe we started with Tim, so for closings, we'll start with Christina. Great, thank you so much everyone for coming. I appreciate seeing your faces here, and hopefully I can meet all of you afterwards on an individual basis. But it's extremely important to me to get my message out. I believe I'm a person that can bring people together. I believe I can work with all different types of senators, legislators, and the governor. It's gonna be very important that we all work together to move this state forward. Again, I highly support education, business, anti-tax. I'm pro-life, pro-family. I uh, am so happy to have my husband here. Thank you very much. He has definitely supported me through this process. And it's been a joy. I've really learned a great deal. I've met some wonderful people. But it's really important that you get out to vote on August 28th. We need your support. It's extremely important. Early ballots go out August 1st. Please urge your friends to vote. No time like the present. This is gonna be a pivotal time in our great state. We have a lot of people who uh, are not necessarily supporting our side and we need you, we need your support. So please visit my website, kellyforld23.com and I appreciate your support, thank you. Every election is important. Every election in our country is a privilege, a privilege to, to engage and to treasure because uh, there's not free and fair elections in all sorts of places in this world whether one votes Republican or Democrat or Independent, doesn't matter. The red on our flag was painted by men and women who bled for our country to give us that right. And we need to, we need to honor that right. Um, if you don't vote for me, vote for her. Thanks, Tim. If you don't vote for me, Certainly don't vote for the person who doesn't think it's important enough to be with you tonight, to answer your questions, to be transparent, to be accessible. We're both out there. Where is she? It's ridiculous. That's not how she ran, but that's how she is. I pray for her, and I sure hope she doesn't win the election. All right, and that ends one of the friendlier debates I've ever been a part of. <laughs> Real quick, I just wanna thank you both, Tim and Christina, for participating. Um, to our audience, thank you for your questions. Thank you for coming out. Uh, if you want to inform yourself further about the election, please visit www.azcleanelections.gov slash voter dashboard for a more customized election experience. You can find information on the primary election, the candidates, the issues. You can also view this debate again on demand. Um, you probably got a debate evaluation form on your way in. Uh, if you'd please return that to one of the volunteers on your way out. 
Your feedback's important. It helped shape the, the format of this debate this year after 2016, so moving forward, uh, we're open to suggestions and changes. Again, thank you all for coming tonight. You're welcome to stay and speak directly to the candidates.